I'm Ellie Shore, and I've been organizing art salons since 2012, now almost 10 years. Our salons feature some of the leading contemporary artists in South Florida, and they share their work and talk about their art practices. Over the years that I've been organizing art salons, I've been increasingly drawn to work by artists focusing on issues that we are all confronting in our lives as individuals, as a nation, as a multicultural society. The environmental subject keeps coming back with greater and greater urgency. And many artists are addressing it in all kinds of very exciting and very innovative ways. One of those is our speaker tonight, Christine Peterson. She's well known in South Florida for her drawings, videos, performances, shadow puppetry more recently, and installations highlighting the Florida environment and its complex history. She describes herself, and I'm going to read this because I love this description, as a voracious reader of local history, as well as an avid naturalist, birder, explorer, and wild thing. She says, I am most alive when I am inside the scenery, tramping the landscape, barefoot and muddy. My artwork is a result of my experience of living in the Deep South a place I genuinely love and feel connected to, yet often mourn for. What materializes is not so much a straightforward viewpoint as a shadow world draped in the ignoble past and the questionable future. She says, I want to be a storyteller. I want to believe that life is still wild. I also found a quote that I'd really like to share with you that was written by Nicole Martinez. She's an art writer in Miami. She says, years from now, when Florida's marshy Everglades are buried under liters of salt and sea, Christina Peterson's work will be its halting tombstone. Conflating Florida's sordid history with future visions of a paradise lost, Her work embodies the mythical and outlandish character that has earned the Florida its weird reputation. Lawless frontiers, ancient burial grounds, poisonous vermin, and ghostly figures appear in her work as both homage and warning. With her subject matter drawn primarily by research, Peterson works across mediums and often site specifically. Memorializing the spirit of Florida, Peterson's work isn't meant to be hopeful. It's meant as a call to the dead. Christina's talk tonight is titled Memory Palaces of Florida. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Christina Peterson. (laughs) Thank you so much, Al. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, It's a great a great, great chance for me to reflect on my practice, where I've done, where I'm going, and uh, hopefully how I can make it um, a holistic part of my life, which is um, ever more complicated. I think as artists' careers become more complicated and we're required to have ever more skills that we did not learn in school. <laughs> um, so uh, since I had such a great intro, I don't feel like I need to uh, repeat that. Uh, start off with an image of me in my studio, uh, which gives a pretty good indication of uh, the breadth of my art practice, which is definitely not just uh, drawings on a wall anymore. It's really artifacts and books and all the things that become a component in my research and my experience and being a a long-term resident in South Florida and my desires to dig ever deeper into that. So, you know, if you come and visit me, please do. There's all kinds of stuff there that uh, we can we can go into and I can nerd out on. (laughs) So I decided I'll go back a little bit, give a more overview of the practice for the first maybe half hour, and then talk about a few new projects. Um, And if you haven't known me for that many years, if you know me all these Everglades artists, I thought I'd put in an older one just to show you that I was a gallery represented artist, so to speak. It's my second show at Spinello and I mostly was doing Uh, These large-scale drawings, putting myself into these historical narratives. And, you know, at this point, I'd only been back in Miami where I grew up for a few years. So really wasn't dealing with the landscape yet. But 
What I found was that ever more, uh, the longer I lived here, the more I dug, the more I was visiting the Everglades again, the landscape really just started to take over. So this is, you know, one of the last examples of using myself in this way. And you can see here that Artemis is, you know, almost being swallowed up by the cypress stone at this point. And eventually the landscape just pushed me out, which <laughs> is perfectly fine um, as I became much more interested in how human history is actually written into the natural world. I love visiting writers' homes and graves. So this pair of drawings are trees from the graves of two female Southern writers, Eudora Welty and Zora Neale Hurston. And what's really significant to me in these is they not only where and how they're buried, but how the character of these two species of trees, a juniper deliberately planted in a regal Southern cemetery and a Brazilian pepper, that no one plants on purpose, you know, planted next to the train tracks, ultimately reflect the difference in the lives and the death of these two women. And so the trees are really act as portraits and narratives. Those drawings, by the way, have became part of this really cool project that Pam did called Inside Out um, to bring reproductions of artwork from their collection out into neighborhoods. And, you know, I really like it when this stuff happens and you get really great public programming. So um, it's something I've always liked about Pam and being part of their collection. Things really started to change in 2015 when I got awarded an area residence to spend a month in the Everglades and um, really changed my life. And it wasn't because I hadn't spent time there growing up. I actually did. But living there and speaking with scientists and the naturalists and the historians, it really helped me to understand that this place has a very long history of human occupation before it became a national park. And after that, I, I curated this ridiculous large-scale <laughs> performance for the uh, 100th anniversary of the park based on the history of bird hunting that led directly to the park's formation. And it really was this chance to take my art out of the studio and back into the landscape itself where the stories came from and also bring people to these places. And there was, there was a bunch of people there who'd never been there before. And that was a really exciting and important component of what I'm doing. And after that, I, I kind of went headlong into a bunch of performances. And, you know, it's a huge part of what I like doing them is that, you know, even though they're a lot of work and you almost never get paid that well. They're a great way to work with talented people in these amazing places and to bring people out to them and have them think about these places in a different way. And at the same time, I started having uh, these exhibitions in more non-traditional art spaces, like this one, which is actually in the visitor center of the park. And so the first time I was really able to bring together all the different facets of my practice under one roof. So besides the exhibition itself, which was drawings and artifacts, you can see I'm starting to not use white paper. <laughs> it was also like, a, you know, during the opening, we had this whole day long adventure, basically, where visitors could take tours with rangers and scientists. They could visit the archives. They could see a shadow puppet performance in the Nike missile site, listen to a band, get a tarot card reading, and even picnic on my dad's uh, now famous alligator stew. <laughs> that was a really good day. Um, also sets a very high standard for art events that I can't always keep up, but I'm incredibly grateful for that relationship with Ari that continues Videos have also become another way for me to speak directly from the landscape. And I'm going to show you a couple of clips in just a minute. And it does include uh, another shadow puppet in performance as well. So.
Okay. <laughs> so um, the other solo exhibition I had around the same time in, in 2018, 2019 uh, was at the Deering Estate where I did a residency in 2012 and really have maintained a really uh, tight relationship with them since then. I think it's a spectacular place um, that has this really multifaceted um stuff including you know the heart collection and the history and the natural history and the archaeology and so it's just a really important but I think underappreciated place and you know they let me have basically this sort of unprecedented access to the collection and moving things around and putting stuff you know where I wanted bring things out of the collection so not only did I hang a bunch of drawings, some of which had hung in other spaces and I got to see them in this you know incredible space like this that's had Goyas and El Grecos hanging in it, or to have artwork that you know directly talks about artifacts in the collection. That's Bobby the Bobcat there on the right. But I think almost most interesting is that I brought in a bunch of stuff that I had inherited from my Swedish grandparents, because I thought it was a way to talk about this journey that Charles Deering and many others take from Europe across the Atlantic. So the desk there is one that my grandfather had made next to Charles Deering's. And one of the most interesting that I liked was the smallest one, which was just bringing in my Swedish grandparents' bridal linens and putting it into the Deering historic linen display. And it's just the ability to work in this historical space instead of a boring white room and bring in my own history in a direct way. It was, it was really exciting and a new thing for me to understand that I could even do. And I'm continuing to work with them through 2019 Ellie's grant to, uh, well, I've already created the large scale drawing of Cutler Fossil site, actually. And it was on display at the airport last year. And now it's going to continue to live as they are going to be sort of launching an exhibition about Cutler Fossil site. If you don't know it, it's like the most important archaeological site south of Lake Okeechobee, it proves that there was human, has been human occupation here for at least 10,000 years. And so the original idea for these drawings, which was to make them in a 360 degree circle, is going to happen and they'll be able to be outside and mobile so that hopefully in the future they're actually going to travel around Florida and maybe even to, you know, sites like natural history museums or other outdoor spaces. So I'm really excited about uh, that sort of partnership and uh, and delving into archaeology has been um, just another great layer in me understanding Florida a whole lot better. Tons of archaeological sites in Florida I super recommend to visit and get to know. So yeah, so all six of those will be in a circle. I'm really I'm kind of obsessed with the cyclorama in Atlanta, so that's, uh, <laughs> I started dreaming about doing my own version of it. Uh, this is a Window display created for book leggers um, that was there. Again, this opportunity to like bring in all my detritus and talk about Florida history. And there is currently one up on Miami Beach, uh, much more fun and funky beachy. Uh, <laughs> that one's still there at the moment. And this was my first public art project at this really sweet developmental center south of the airport. And my first attempt at you know, doing an outdoor piece like this, uh, CNC cut panels. And, you know, the art in public places are really great because they, they force you to work in new material and sometimes it's scary and there's a lot of administrative and bureaucracy stuff involved. But then you get, you know, you get this permanent art piece, which is pretty cool. And this is my second art in public places, large scale drawing on wood. So this was my first time venturing into that, which I'm still doing. The place is called Caribbean Village, so I really wanted to talk about like the way our native landscape has intersected and, and almost melded completely with so many Caribbean aspects that we think of as native but are actually Caribbean, like all Paris. <laughs> Uh, and then the other thing in the same, the same room on the other side was my first wallpaper. Um, and I just launched a different version of it for sale. Uh, so I'm really excited about that through Windwood Wallpaper again, for honoring different aspects of native and Caribbean culture. And then actually, uh, 
I was going to include it, but I forgot. <laughs> I'm working on a second wallpaper that is talking about red line history. And that is going to be installed soon. So I'll be able to share that. And this is the version that is for sales, a little brighter and a few different changes. And then this show, which I feel like I've talked to everybody in Miami about, so <laughs> I spend that much time on it. But basically the most like immersive project I did at the height of COVID, creating this cemetery to honor the lost Pine Rockland landscape and characters and creatures within it. It used just a multitude of all material I could think of. Uh, there was, you know, large scale drawing on wood, you know, I brought in all kinds of natural materials. I carved the tombstones, hand carved the tombstones so that they could be, so you could create grave rubbings of them, which is something I've been doing for a long time. And, you know, just honoring some lesser known history you know a lot of it was really those like aha moments when you think like I can't believe I didn't know this about my own hometown how did I no one ever tell me that you know we used to have seals on the beach or you know parakeets and stuff like that so and I'm going to show a little video that um I'll prelude in a second the Miami Book Fair actually after this exhibition commissioned me to do some video versions of some of the tombstones Few today realize that Bahamians were some of the first settlers in what would become Miami and were fundamental to the creation of the city as we know it today. White pioneers from the Northeast benefited enormously from their knowledge and expertise. Consider how profound the Caribbean culture, ecology, and cuisine has permeated South Florida, so pervasive as to be invisible or rather identified as our own. It has seeped into our landscape from the coconut palms to the mango explosions that herald our hurricane summers. They taught white settlers how to adapt to the heat and mosquitoes of the jungle wilderness, how to grow tropical foods, how to use local material. Black Bahamian laborers built some of our most treasured landmarks in Miami, including Vizcaya. They did the hardest work and received the least credit the back-breaking work of clearing land and cutting roads and ditches through the jungle, through limestone, laying railroad tracks, grubbing the ancient saw palmettos of Miami Beach and working the Kunti Mills, Miami's first industry, processing the tuber of the ancient cycad plant, once a dominant plant of the pine rockland, into arrowroot starch, all for the benefit of white pioneers building empires. Along with the Seminoles, they influenced the character of Miami's architecture through their great skill and design elements. The old Bahamian section of Coconut Grove, commonly referred to as Kibo, still features many of these Bahamian-style homes. We owe an enormous debt to the Bahamian pioneers, who brought with them their knowledge of how to survive hurricanes and the harsh conditions of tropical living, and the literal fruits of its labor. Many of them are buried here at Miami City Cemetery, as well as in Coconut Grove and the recently discovered Lemon City Cemetery. I'm really hoping actually to start a podcast, a cemetery podcast later this year. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, so, you know, in addition to the main room, the project room of Lucas Projects uh, had a seance room and I brought in my South Florida library, which has gotten pretty nerdy and good um, and uh, I'm super welcoming you again to like come visit if you want to borrow a book etc so it's just you know really was the, the most sort of comprehensive view of all the things that I'm interested in and want to talk about and somehow even though it was COVID <laughs> Uh, we managed to have a few events. I, you know, again, that's so important to me. So, you know, we had these sessions making morning wreaths from, you know, just from plants I collected in the neighborhood. Um, we had a daguerreotype session. We had um, this closing funeral party with like Ouija board reading and um, Donzi the band played to an audience of four people. <laughs> um, the whole thing was uh, really weird and wonderful. And this one I just throw in because um, just got hung at the airport, which is pretty cool. And um, it was a really nice program that the airport did towards the beginning of COVID 
an open call to um, purchase local artists' work. So, and Dry Tortuga is, is a really spectacular place that a lot of people don't know about still. It is a part of Florida and the Everglades National Park System, but it is this you know, crazy island off of Key West. Um, you can take a catamaran to you, you can camp there for a few days and it's like spectacular coral reefs and um, insane bird nesting area. And it also has this utterly ridiculous fort, giant fort that was built in the 1840s. It just seems to make no sense anymore. Um, I think it's still considered the largest masonry brick structure in the Northern hemisphere, et cetera. So it's, uh, yeah, it's really, really cool. <laughs> so on to current projects. This got an LA's Create Award to partner with Art Sale and Friends of the Everglades to create an illustrated bilingual book for understanding climate change in South Florida. The project is still in the research and development phase. You know, there's obviously <laughs> was some slowdown. Um, but as the 2021 artist, you know, Art Sale Artist in Residence, which is a nomadic research-based residency. I've been able to do a lot of traveling with them. And it's been this really terrific way to get to know uh, other parts of Florida, you know, become pretty adept at uh, the stuff around here, but understanding better what's happening with Lake Okeechobee, what's happening with things like ranches and things that you don't hear about so much here um, has been really great. And all in all, I'd say it's really made me love this idea of sort of getting to know a place in this really multifaceted comprehensive way to understand like the layers of history to understand the natural landscape and and again to sort of peel out what you know what human history exists when you look at a landscape you know so the memory palaces of florida concept really evolved last fall you know through doing these deep dives and, you know, and the hope of coming out with a much broader understanding of what's going on, you know, I think it's easy to get caught up in all these little things. And I've really been working towards having a better overview of what Florida is, what it has been, um, you know, what's really significant and matters and is sacred. If you know what memory palaces are, it might be because <laughs> of watching Benedict Cumberbatch, Sherlock, which is kind of how I got a good picture of it. It's basically a memorization technique. Um, it actually goes back to the Greeks um, and it uses these strong visual associations to you know, take you through the sort of imaginary palace in your mind and um, assign different steps along the way. So, but the way I'm thinking of memory palaces for this series is as places that provide a really unique opportunity to access like a multitude of historical events and environmental concepts, basically places that hold a lot of information and memory. And another way I guess I would think of them is as sacred places or places that haunt me. <laughs> I started with this region because I've, you know, like I said, I've kind of gotten to know other parts of Florida more recently, especially in North Florida and this area you can see that had all these, these slave plantations have really opened my eyes to the level of slavery, for example, that actually existed here and how intertwined it is with our becoming a state in 1820 and Andrew Jackson as our first governor and the Seminole Wars. And this is actually one of the few buildings that's left. Um, the plantation itself was burned by the Seminoles. Many of the slaves then joined them. I could really get into that because it's really interesting history. But I just want to say that it's what's really interesting to me. Uh, uh, this is just sort of one early sketch. It's not even really successful, but I, I like the idea of trying to use these, these Gothic and Renaissance characters that would have, you know, uh, honored religion in the past to use them to talk about what I consider to be sacred spaces. And um, what's interesting is these spaces are, a lot of them are state parks and they're really lovely and they feel like untouched in a lot of ways. And, and you realize that, you know, beautiful places in Florida, like anywhere else often resonate with a brutal past. And I think one of the reasons that the myth of Florida as this young place persists is there aren't, a lot of these old buildings around, which happened for a lot of reasons from, you know, Spaniards basically just used us as an outpost to 
or incredibly brutal weather that kills everything you leave outside or, or just like these deep prejudices and racism that's built into archaeology, for example. But we have stuff, you know, as old as anywhere. We have ancient saw palmettos that are older than Redwood Forest, and we have Native American mounds older than the pyramids that were all over Florida when they arrived. But we don't tend to think of trees as being living artifacts of history, much less observers or participants, but they are this wondrous tree, for example, which I think is now considered the oldest tree in Florida since the whole, you know, meth smoking incident burned down the old cypress. Uh, and I really, I really like the sign um, that this live oak has withstood hurricane winds, fires, droughts, wars, and the follies of mankind for centuries. Please help us protect this magnificent tree. Um, and she really is magnificent. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, she's also situated, again, in this incredibly rich and diverse spot that has seen and heard and felt almost the entire range of human occupation. So, you know, a lot of it is, is really uh, honoring trees specifically. I really, you know, and I think it's so interesting that, you know, all this scientific research has come out that talks about the intelligence of trees and understanding more the ways in which they speak to each other and they survive and they feel things. So this is another site I visited in the last couple of years for a much more specific history, um, the last living location of the Carolina parakeet. And I'm going to show you one more video that I did also for the Miami Book Fair. The beautiful but doomed Carolina parakeet was our only parrot species native to the eastern and southern United States. Once upon a time, flocks of up to a thousand of these bright, green, gregarious birds could be heard from miles away. They lived in old-growth wetland forests along rivers, swamps, and prairies like this one, roosting and nesting in large hollow trees like cypress of up to 30 birds together. Florida had the first sighting on record in 1583 and had the densest population of perhaps several hundred thousand, but they could be found as far north as the Great Lakes. It was called Puzalani, Head of Yellow, or Pachi by the Seminole. There are extensive early accounts of the prevalence of this bird, up to and including in two of my favorite Florida books, The Yearling and The Land Remembered. How wondrous the sight of huge flocks of hundreds of colorful and raucous parrots would have been to newly arrived Europeans. How horrific that in reality they chose slaughter. For in many ways the history of the Carolina parakeet's decline parallels the history of American growth over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries. All that prosperity came with many terrible costs as the United States expanded and remade the landscape and its people to suit its needs. So many native species once common and who had prospered under a thousand native tribes were wiped out in mere decades. The Carolina parakeet mostly ate the seeds and fruits of forest trees and in particular loved to eat cockleburs, a toxic plant considered the agricultural pest of grain crops yet they were slaughtered in huge numbers by wrathful farmers anyway. Worst of all, the task of hunting was made easy by the highly social parakeet's flock behavior of returning to where birds had been killed or injured, gathering around them to mourn so that even more could be shot, sealing their doom. This killing, combined with massive forest destruction throughout the bird's range, hunting for its bright feathers to be used in the millinery trade, and possible disease brought on by the introduction of honeybees and chickens, caused the Carolina parakeet's population to collapse in the 1800s. It was rarely reported outside Florida after 1860, restricted to these central swamps and prairies. The very last known nesting location of the Carolina parakeet was somewhere here, within the Kissimmee Prairie Preserve State Park in Okeechobee County, and the last known wild specimen 
was shot here in 1904. The last captive bird died at the Cincinnati Zoo on February 21st, 1918. And as I wander this prairie, I can't help but wonder at how the trees remember those loud, wondrous birds and are lonely without them. And which tree did the last parakeet erupt from? And which tree is marked the deepest? Their song and vibrant colors haunting them still. Not to uh, put a total downer on that park, I <laughs> will say it's a really incredible park I only got to know recently. Um, and it happens to be in what's considered the darkest spot in Florida. So it's actually the first official dark park. And in addition to like regular campsites, they have, um, I'm going to call them astrophotography sites that are really dark spots. So it's like, you know, if you do astrophotography, it's the place to go. And there's actually teeming with wildlife, by the way, which is great. <laughs> so the last, uh, the last one in the Memory Palace series, this one is from Canaveral National Seashore, which... Again, I only visited recently. It's the largest intact, pristine barrier island coastline left in Florida. It's really wonderful. And these coastal hammock trees like all bend heavily from the wind. Like they're like these ant trees and they're just amazing. So that spot's really haunted me for a while. And then I am nearing the end i'm gonna (laughs) end on a high note like a local news does and show you a few more humorous projects fun stuff that i did uh it was really one of the best things i saw come out of the covid months was the sketty museum challenge um where just thousands of people from all over the world took on classical art paintings and figured out how to recreate them trapped inside their homes. Um, if you haven't seen it, it was like, it's just like, it's amazing. So, you know, go online immediately and look and see all these like wonderful renditions. Uh, this is one of my favorite artists. And uh, this was the second rendition. <laughs> I even brought my cat in. She was really unhappy about it, but um, that was another fun one to do. And then uh, a little more locally is a rendition of my favorite painting at Disney's Haunted Mansion when I was totally obsessed with as a kid and uh, realized uh, as I got into Everglades stuff that it was uh, actually incredibly appropriate to take on. And uh, yes, we are still thinking about doing the rest of them as well. (laughs) So stay tuned. And then the very last thing, this was just in an exhibition during Basel. You know, another one of my loves is, you know, those, these like uh, pulp fiction kind of novels and, you know, the Everglades is always getting uh, used as a ridiculous background. So this was just a, there's a little animated version of it. So it was part of an installation. Uh, I think we're pretty well done. Let's see, is that the last one? Yep. Are anyone still there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you, your, your video about the Carolina parakeets was so sad. And, and, and then your ballerina over the alligator. <laughs> I'm a true Gemini. <laughs> I'm like, oh, it's like, yeah, darker light, you know, I need both. Well, you have, for me, you you just stripped away civilization. You stripped away all of the ordinary, ugly stuff that surrounds us every day and brought us back to where we actually live. And I thank you for that. I would like to also uh, let people know that there's going to, that um, Christina is one of the artists in a show that's opening February 10th. I think it's already open, but the reception is February 10th at the Frank in Pembroke Pines. And I hope to be there and I hope to see a lot of you there also. Um, they, they always do a beautiful job. And that's a bunch of really great artists dealing with environmental stuff. So, and it's a beautiful space. So I'm really excited about that. Thank you. You have some new work that's going to be there. 
Um, they actually didn't choose my newest work, uh, but that's fine too. Ah, interesting. I'm, I'm not someone who thinks you always have to show the newest stuff. You know, I like, you know, showing a body of work too. It all gets shown sooner yeah. or later in unexpected ways. Mm -hmm. Being in the airport, all kinds of good things. Yeah, exactly. So I think we're going to say goodnight for now. This has been wonderful. Thank you.